Welcome everybody to this fifth session of the Green Post Corner Talks organized by the Green European Foundation. I'm Dirk Holemans, co-president of the foundation and director of Oikos, the Green Flemish think tank and your host. In this fifth session, we will discuss the future and also the situation of work in the current crisis. As everybody knows, the first day of this month was the International Labour Day, which brought into the public debate already important questions on the future of work. I think that the Corona crisis already made three points clear. First, we know what the essential jobs are that keep our society running. Nurses, people working in childcare, elderly care, cleaners, etc. And this raises the question, why these jobs that contribute the most to our well-being outpaced pay the least. So we really need to need a debate on what are the essential jobs and how do we evaluate them? How do we care for care workers, you could say? The second point is about the unpaid emotional and domestic labor. It are mostly women taking on responsibility for children at home as schools and uh, nurseries are closed or they take care if someone of the family falls ill. The third point, and we all discovered it, actually we are doing it right now, is that uh, yeah, teleworking at home is a real option and we don't always have to travel a thousand kilometers to end an international congress. So what are the consequences of teleworking and in a broader sense, digitization of many fields in society? The overall question is how a different perspective on work, unpaid labor, paid labor, could enable our societies to transition to a different, better post-corona economy and working world. In order to discuss this wide range of issues, we have two great speakers today. The first is Elena Milos, project coordinator at Uni Europe, the European Services Workers Union, and also the second speaker is Kim van Sparentak. She's member of the European Parliament for the Greens, the EFA group. For the people following this uh, webinar, you can put your questions in the chat. Uh, you can also use uh, Twitter if you want and use the hashtag Green European Foundation. Then I see your questions in my chat bo box and in the second part of this talk, then I will address these questions to the two speakers. First, now we give the floor to Yelena. And so Yelena, could you give us a view on the situation on the workers' rights amidst the crisis, including the gender perspective and also the role of trade unions? And I think also it would be crucial to link the labor and care issues as they arise at the moment to the ecological crisis. Uh, so Yelena, I'm happy to give you the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dirk. And uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Jeff for uh, inviting me to this uh, conversation. I'm uh, very pleased uh, to be here, and uh, quite frankly, I'm uh, I'm also quite quite excited to be uh, having this uh, conversation uh, uh, with you. Uh, so, as said, I'm uh, I'm project coordinator at uh, at Uni Europa, and I work in the in the care sector. So, I'm going to be uh, talking a bit more today about um, about the the care workers. Um, apart from being a labor activist, I'm also um, I'm active in green groups, and uh, I'm also a member of the Institute for Political Ecology um, uh, from Croatia. Uh, today, I would like to um, talk more on the trade union pandemics, uh, on the trade union perspective on the on the current pandemics. I would like to actually address uh, four main points um, on on the matter. So the first point that Dirk uh, actually suggested is that we need to reevaluate uh, the notion of uh, essential work and what it means for our society today. The second is that the women that women bear the brunt of this crisis, which means that we need to invest much more efforts and, and invest much more in gender equality policy. Third is that we see that unions today actually play a crucial role not only in saving lives, but uh, not only in saving workplaces, but actually in saving in, in saving lives. Uh, so that we also need to think and uh, and actually uh, strengthen the role, uh, think about the role of trade unions to actually strengthen their role. 
And the fourth point I would like to make is that uh, care needs to be put at the center of our economies. And today, while thinking about the, the post-corona uh, uh, post crisis um, uh, society. Um, so first about the, about the notion of uh, essential work. Uh, so we've seen uh, supermarket workers, cleaners, uh, care workers uh, take the front lines and, uh, and fight this uh, pandemic. We've seen a lot of public praise for these workers, but they also re still remain in low paid, precarious and undervalued, uh, and undervalued jobs. We see care workers who are, uh, who are protecting the most vulnerable in our society while risking their lives and risking their lives while doing that. But at the same time, they are working in nursing home or providing home care without personal protective equipment, without, uh, without testing, they are understaffed, uh, they have uh, unpaid overtime. So these are uh, only some of the, the issues that the trade unions uh, are working on, uh, uh, on uh, today. So uh, we need to think about actually who are the workers who keep our society running. And uh, we need to tell ourselves that these workers actually deserve more. And that means that they deserve recognition, but also this, uh, the, uh, also deserve better pay and better working conditions. So this is not only a trade union demand, but I think that this should be at the center of our political demands uh, 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 today. Uh, so this is a uh, this is actually a point on the notion of uh, essential uh, of essential work. Uh, the second point would be that uh, this is very much a gender crisis. I mean, uh, it is obvious that uh, that uh, most of the frontline workers today are uh, women. Uh, let me just say that women represent 70% of workers in care, in health, in cleaning. Women also represent the majority of precarious and informal workers. Women are facing numerous challenges in, uh, in their workplace, from lack of health and safety equipment to lack of unpaid family leave to uh, to lack of paid family leave, to the lack of actually uh, paid sick leave. So um, uh, uh, unions can and are working with employers and, gov and governments to negotiate better working conditions, to negotiate uh, 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 wage increases, uh, to negotiate sick leave, to negotiate family leave. And in addition to, to being frontline workers, we see that, the women, that women are facing an overload in family responsibilities, and we see an increase in, 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 in domestic violence. And this is not actually caused by the crisis. This is actually the mirror of how our society works today. So, we, so this is not a new development, and this is actually a consequence of us not taking sufficient action to increase gender equality and to work on gender equality. And while we are talking about this fact, there is also a talk that the, the uh, there is also a talk that the gender pay transparency directive in the EU is going to be put on uh, put on ice. So that means that we are postponing actually our work on gender equality while at, while at this at this point in time we should be doubling it. Um, so uh, this is this is that this is the point that uh, uh, that I think is uh, is also is also crucial that. The, the crisis actually showed it did not put enough effort in increasing gender equality and that there is so much more work to do. Um, and the third point is actually about the, the role of, of trade unions and the role of collect, collective bargaining, um, which actually I think that um, we, do, uh, we are not dedicating enough attention to, to this aspect. Uh, so uh, I think that the, this health, health healthcare crisis is also a workplace crisis. And this is why at the uni, uh, we are asking for COVID-19 to be recognized as occupational disease, allowing for pre pre preventive measures and, and compensation. Trade unions have proven to be essential in this crisis. Uh, if uh, unions provided actually, just to mention a few, just to mention a few examples, provided protective equipment for care workers in Ireland, we have testing for every care worker in Austria, thanks to trade union. We have hazard paid for care workers in Italy, for care workers in, um, in, in Slovenia. So these are only some of the examples why trade unions met, matter today. We see that the unionized workforce is doing better. And we see that actually the workers who are hit hardest are the un ununionized workers who are actually informal, 
who are working in informal and precarious employment. And this is what we need to uh, uh, reverse today, the, flex the flexibilization of the, of, the, of the labor market. In, in that sense, we, we actually need to put a lot of effort in supporting unions. And in that sense, I think that strengthening collective bargaining is tool to protect the workers and tool to ensure their economic and social rights, but it also a tool to push for green clauses in collective bargaining as well. So as an OECD study from last year uh, states that uh, collective bargaining has actually been, been put under pressure by the rise of precarious forms of employment and by the fle flexibilization of labor market relations. So the OECD study suggests that we need to improve and that we need to revamp collective bargaining if we want to prevent the labor market, the rising uh, labor market, uh, uh, labor market inequalities. So as I'm trying to say, the trade unions are actually are representing the voice of the workers in this crisis, and not only in this crisis, but every day. They need access to the workplace, and that's actually why we need to make it a political demand to strengthen collective bargaining on the EU level and to strengthen collective bargaining bargaining in our member states. And, uh, and we need to actually, actually emphasize that companies need to be neutral and let, uh, let union access uh, and uh, let, let uh, unions actually organize workers be because they can, do, uh, mm, they can do so much, not only in this crisis, but actually in, in improving our, our, our lives um, uh, every day. Um, so uh, the fourth point I would like to make is, uh, and, and my last point, it, is that uh, the care needs to be put at the center of our economies. So we see that care workers are among the frontline front workers. And I'm not just saying talking about doctors and nurses, but we also need to be talking about home care workers, about nursing homes, about the workers who work in nursing homes. We see that in this pandemics, nursing homes are hardest hit by the coronavirus crisis because more than half of deaths uh, from coronavirus uh, are actually occurring, actually occurred in, in, in nursing home. And this is a result of bad conditions of understaffing uh, uh, and of underinvestment in those sectors. So what I think is clear today is that there is no going back to business as usual. And after this crisis, we are going to, to see a long-term economic recessions recession and and that means that we need to have a massive and sustainable investment plan and that plan needs to be socially environmentally just what that means when we go back to the notion of essential work is that actually we need to change our priorities we need to prioritize social well-being and we need to take seriously the threat to our planet so the crucial thing i think uh, uh, today is to make investment in health and care services one of our priorities. And, and these investments need to be linked to better working conditions and to environmental goals. As, as the, uh, the, one of the study of ILO suggests is that by 2030, we will have up to 1 million care jobs missing worldwide. So that is a big problem. And care jobs actually are green job potential for millions of workers in the EU. And they can give us a better, a social, caring, and a green future. So I think that we need to link the Green Deal for Europe with the Care Deal for Europe, as you are saying, uh, in uh, in the Greens Recovery uh, Plan. And I really like uh, and I really like the sound of it. Um, so for now, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna stop. Thank you. Uh, one question I would like to ask, you mentioned uh, collective bargaining and you talked about uh, including green demands. Could you give an example of this? In, in terms of the collective bargaining, we can also talk about the, the, about the green, uh, let's, let's put it like that, the green collective bargaining. And there are also some databases about what the trade unions are doing. Uh, in that sense, of course, depending on the on the sectors um, uh, you are working on, but that uh, means putting clauses on the level of uh, companies and sector that is that are linked to, for example, uh, to to green commuting that are uh, linked to, for example, if we are talking about um, the, the 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 cleaning sector to using chemicals that are environmentally friendly. So 
a lot of things that means investing in uh, uh, in uh, workers to also use uh, green means of uh, transport that means that can mean actually a quite span of things depending on the sector uh, we are working in but what, what i'm trying to say is that that can be used uh, as a tool to push for um, for the for the for the green causes in on the level of, of companies and on the level of sectors Okay, thanks for the answer. We now move to uh, Kim van Sparentak, who is, as I said, member of the European Parliament for the Greens EFA group. Uh, Kim, your group published a recovery and resilience plan. Elena already mentioned. Uh, I think it's important you explain to us what the main lines in this plan are. And then second, as I would really like to hear your opinion about the impact of the crisis on the youth. Uh, so, Kim, I'm happy to give you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and very interesting, the points you made just, Lena. Thank you for that too. Um, so on the recovery plan that we have published a few weeks ago, um, I think uh, you can could say that the, one of the main messages, messages that we wanted to give is that uh, we only can move forward and we can't go back. Um, there's only um, a, a way to get out of this crisis if we make sure that we create a greener Europe um, and a more social Europe. And we uh, can't go back to the status quo because this was already a climate crisis. We have to make sure that um, we really, if we make investments, then they have to be green. Um, the Commission, of course, um, has already put it very clear in our pillars that um, the Green Deal is one of the main issues they want to work on. And there has been calls from, for example, Eastern European member states to perhaps not do that too much, to not burden uh, companies with extra uh, green requirements. Whereas we say, okay, this is actually the moment to move forward, to make these green investments, to create European green public works, and by that, boosting the economy and creating uh, green jobs. Um, next to that, we also see uh, an opportunity for, um, for the digital investments. Um, you know, uh, the, the digital economy has gotten an enormous boost um, uh, from um, this COVID-19 crisis, uh, just because we are now all working on it as we are right now, you know, we are completely dependent on it. And there's a lot of interesting uh, startups, for example, that are now um, creating uh, uh, more jobs uh, also, which is also going to benefit our economy. And that's why we have to continue also on uh, making sure that the regulations around the digital sphere will uh, will continue um, to make sure that uh, we don't create new um, big massive uh, companies that are hampering the freedom of the internet. And I think thirdly, when we're talking about how we see uh, the future of Europe in our recovery plan is a, a more social Europe and um, also with a strong focus on gender. Um, the points that Jelena just made about care work um, uh, we are also uh, hugely in favor of formalizing care work and see if we can do anything in that regard, for example, by giving care credits to, to people who take care of their children or family members or other, um, or other closed ones. Um, just to go a bit into the topic of the future of work related to this, um, I think to talk about the future of work, um, we also have to go back and look at the financial crisis from uh, 10 years ago. Um, first of all, what we saw is that um, austerity, of course, hit a lot of um, uh, people that were working in the public sector. And um, these are now the people that are keeping our, uh, our economy and our societies running. They are the people caring for the elderly and caring for the people that are sick. They are the people that make sure that our kids still get their education. Um, and all these budget cuts that they have suffered, the, the non-appreciation and um, you know, uh, and in general, you know, the, the lack of payment uh, that they got um, that has to change, that has to shift, and this is something that we we can't go back to, and we can't repeat this mistake again. And same goes for um, the way that we saw that big corporations went about with the the growing uh, unemployment, which is something that is projected, of course, to, that we see happening again. Many people will lose their jobs because of the economic crisis that will follow, and. If we give these big corporations the opportunity again, then they might uh, repeat what they have done. So what have they done? They created more precarious work situations. They created atypical job conditions. They forced people 
to become self-employed without any rights, but also without the financial benefits and the financial means to actually take care of themselves, to have the, the proper insurance um, or to save for a pension. And um, this is something that um, is already a huge problem. It was already a problem also before the COVID crisis that we saw people, for example, in the platform economy working um, uh, uh, with uh, very little money uh, and no social security, no paid sick leave. And um, now during the crisis, it is, this has even become more clear. It is even more clear that the people that are uh, deemed essential because they are, um, the, for example, on their bicycles, um, the so-called riders, um, they have to continue working, but they don't, but because they are self-employed, they uh, have to make sure that they um, protect themselves all by themselves. And um, they often don't even have the uh, financial opportunity to not, um, to not work, so they don't even have a choice whether they put themselves at risk. And this is something that we have to make sure that we really continue working on this. Um, there's a lot of talk also about, you know, the gender equality strat strategy, but also, you know, whether the, the platform work summit will be will be postponed, um, because this is all a bit more difficult for uh, for employers. But actually, if we don't say right now, okay, this is the, where we draw the line, and we're not going to give you the opportunity to uh, to uh, exploit workers even more uh, during this crisis when people are in need of a job or in need for some income, then it's uh, probably going to get even more out of hand. And this is uh, where we take a strong stance and where we where we draw the line. Then when we're talking about things that we have to really um, change and, and look different at um, when uh, when we're talking about European legislation, I think one important thing is the occupational health, health and safety strategy that will uh, come up. Um, you know, uh, how how are we going about that, and will we also um, expand it a bit more to make sure that people who are working um, really feel safe, um, and 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 that we're not only talking about you know the the safety of machinery etc what they're working with but also for example if they get the the proper protective gear when they're working in in healthcare centers and um, the discussion of um, uh, collective bargaining also related to platform work to gig work but also related to the new discussion that we're going to have on a on a minimum income on a you know uh, on a European level I think that. Um, uh, a collective bargaining will be one of the main parts in that. Well, then lastly, about uh, youth employment, we n we've seen the devastating effect of um, of the financial crisis on youth. Um, uh, I'm from the generation that graduated uh, with no jobs to be found, um, and I studied um, with uh, many people that actually had to move away from their country um, in Spain, in, in Greece, that came to the Netherlands to study there, hoping to perhaps get a job there. Um, we can't afford um, the current young generation that will graduate soon to be a lost generation again. Um, you know, for, for my generation, many big life decisions have been postponed, and we I, I won't allow it that it will happen to the next generation as well. And um, the, the kind of jobs that we saw created that were the only options for them, that were very precarious um, and atypical, um, those we, we can't have again. So we have to make sure that we, we strengthen the youth guarantee, that we expand it, and um, that, um, yeah, you know, we really show that we have learned our lessons from the previous crisis and um, that uh, the youngest generation will not be affected as much this time. Okay, thanks for this uh, <clears throat> first introduction. You mentioned uh, the proposal of giving care credit people uh, working at home, I guess. Can, maybe you can explain this a bit more, what these uh, care credits, uh, how this would work. Yeah, so it's an idea to um, actually give um, credits to people who uh, take care of, for example, their parents or their kids. Um, and it means that um, it will be sort of formalized in society and that um, you can still get um, a, a pension, build a pension or get uh, sick leave benefits from the government um, if, if something happens to you. It means that um, we, we show, that, uh, basically we show that we appreciate care work as much as any other job, because it is. Um, and um, we formalize it in such a way that you will still have social security. Um, 
despite not having a regular job with a contract and an employer. Okay, thanks. And I guess because uh, the discussion is all over, you already have thought also about the idea of a kind of universal basic income. At least be the moment to put it on the table. I think this is the moment to have discussions about it, more discussions about it, and also to see if we can do European experiments with it and really have a strong European um, comparable research, um, which is so far uh, not yet the case. Um, but I think that, that we see that, um, um, you know, linking social security to jobs is not the way to go forward and the universal basic income can be a way to, um, to go beyond that. But um, yeah, we still, uh, I think there's still not enough uh, knowledge to really say, okay, this is the solution. Um, of course, there's also a lot of, you know, doubts and questions about it. But in general, I think this is the moment to do huge experiments with it. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, Yelena, from the perspective of the unions and looking at uh, the things the European Commission have put on the table, you mentioned the Green Deal, uh, you mentioned the uh, thing about care, what would for you be the priority number one that you would expect the European Union and also the European Parliament to take initiative on what topic? In the crisis, first of all, um, uh, to, to ensure uh, pr uh, protection of uh, of the workers in this crisis. So, as we are saying that, you know, we are already talking about the post-corona cri crisis of uh, getting back to normal. But it, uh, I don't think it's um, I don't think uh, we are getting back uh, to normal. I think that uh, the workplace uh, are uh, still places where people can get infected. And that, that's why we need to push for a European response for for, for protective equipment. Uh, I think that we need to make uh, uh, COVID-19 on, on a list of occupational disease in uh, all EU countries. Uh, uh, we are also working on the, um, as, a, as I said, pushing for the uh, for the gender pay transparency because I, I don't think this is a question we can uh, postpone anymore as we've seen the, the devastating impact of the crisis. Um, uh, on, uh, of the crisis on, on women. So um, uh, these are only, uh, these are, I would say, only some of the demands, but I think that in, in, in the economic sense, as I, as I said, the crucial demand for me uh, is to invest more money in, uh, in health and in care services to actually create green and care jobs, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to reshift focus of, uh, of our social and, and political uh, priorities uh, in, the, um, in, um, in that sense. Um, so yeah, these are, uh, these are I would say, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the main demands. Uh, as I was mentioning, the, uh, the, the strengthening of, of collective uh, bargaining agreements is also, I think this, this should be taken seriously. Uh, and uh, when I was saying about the role of, of, of trade unions, and uh, the, uh, we can also see that uh, in companies, uh, uh, health uh, and safety representatives can be a valuable asset to, to, to employers and, and to companies to actually protect the workers, the workers and, um, and uh, protect, our, um, protect our workplaces uh, uh, as well. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, if I can uh, mention something Derek, that you already uh, did talk about, about the telework. Um, you mentioned that topic, and I think, okay, it's, it's a huge topic, so I will not go too much into it. But uh, I would just say that um, the, uh, one of the uh, campaigns we are doing is also the right to disconnect. So although we are working in, uh, uh, um, these are not normal conditions we are working in, and we are working from our homes, and uh, I think that uh, there are a set of uh, um, a set of things that we can uh, we can do to have the right to connect, such as uh, um, uh, arrange a, a schedule for uh, for uh, for working time, not to expect uh, workers uh, um, to basically uh, to work all, or to work all day without uh, without any rest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are some of the things that we must also uh, uh, bear in mind. Okay, thanks. And the first questions are 
coming in from Facebook and I would really uh, invite people who put a question on Facebook, uh, uh, just write in which country you live, which city, it's always nice then to make to uh, make explicit we are having a kind of European uh, conversation here. And so the first question is, I think for Kim, it's uh, concerning the new youth guarantee proposed by the Commission. What should be the number one in this reform? Um, I think um, it should be a, a stronger uh, youth guarantee. I think it should the, the amount of uh, funding that we have bigger. And I think that is the main fight that we have to go for. And next to that, we have to um, make sure, even more sure that, um, you know, we don't get any, um, uh, how do I say this in a nice way, you know, work opportunities for people that are basically just uh, putting them in a job that uh, that doesn't benefit them or society. Bullshit jobs. Yes, that's what I wanted to say, but I was not allowed, I was not sure if I was allowed to say this word. <laughs> well, uh, Normally, Dutch people, they don't care much about uh, the language they use. I was trying to be polite for a change. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Okay, thanks. There's a second question, which I, I really find uh, interesting, is that on the one hand, it's very really, uh, important that we now see what are the essential jobs. And it's very um, logic that we focus on care, care workers. But somebody mentions that we have to be careful that with trying to define what are the essential jobs we are at the same time making all the crucial sectors invisible because then they are seen as non-essential. And the example is here, everybody working in the culture sector, the artists, performers, um, I think they're really also uh, going through a, a big crisis, which is difficult to see the end of it. So, Kimo, Yelena, if you want to respond to this. I think that the reason also why we are actually uh, talking about the, the essential workers uh, today is to actually emphasize, emphasize how much undervalued um, the, uh, uh, they are. And actually, I think that the, uh, uh, while we have a situation that these actually, that these workers are taking the front line, they are the least paid. So this is actually a sign, a symptom that our labor market is uh, uh, is broken, and that uh, that oh, that what is also broken is the link between the so-called low low skilled labor and the the high skilled labor. So this is not working as we see that these these uh, workers are uh, um, as that uh, the low paid workers are running our society. So that was my basic point. But I fully agree with uh, with what is being said about the workers uh, in, in the culture. Culture is absolutely uh, uh, es es essential uh, for, uh, uh, for for social life, for the functioning of our society. And it's very uh, it's very um, uh, disturbing uh, to see in some countries, such as uh, for example uh, uh, for example in, in in Croatia, that the government is not taking seriously and not actually um, Making uh, enough investment now in uh, culture and culture workers, and actually leaving them, uh, uh, is, is leaving them to, uh, to 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 survive on their own, and it's not it's, uh, there are not enough measures being made for that sector, which is, I think it, it absolutely needs to be uh, to be made. But unfortunately, the reaction of many countries, and that is why I think that we need to also be paying attention uh, to the culture workers, is that they are actually. Um, leaving uh, culture workers uh, to survive on their own. Okay, thanks. Um, Kim, there's one question which uh, you could say it's more personal, but it's also relevant for our democracy. You're a member of the European Parliament, and so the question is, uh, you're probably at home teleworking. How does this affect your work as an elected elected member of the parliament, uh, is the parliament still able to do his work, uh, discussions, uh, asking questions to the commissioners and so on? What's going on at parliament? Yes, so yeah, I, uh, I'm myself, I'm in Rotterdam right now. I'm working from home already for some months, uh, which is a big change for someone who's usually traveling every week. Um, and in general, um, the parliamentary work, um, it's still ongoing. Um, 
but it's more uh, it's more difficult and we have we you see that there's being prioritized a lot so um discussions where we perhaps put new topics on the table are not the, the discussions that are particularly happening um especially in the first weeks the discussions were of course mainly on how are we going to get out of the covid-19 crisis how are we going to make sure that we have uh, solidarity amongst the member states and how do we keep um, the internal market functioning to make sure everyone can get, you know, the protective gear that they need. Um, and now we're at the point of talking about the recovery again, and we also see that most of the other files are starting to run again. But um, yeah, of course, um, the informal discussions that you would normally have with your colleagues or actually or, or with the other uh, politicians are, very, are basically impossible now. Um, which makes it uh, a lot harder to um, to find compromises sometimes and um, and to go for a bit more, um, you know, controversial topics. Um, so it is hampering democracy in that sense uh, quite a bit. And we're really hoping that soon we can uh, get back to work. We have a plenary again this afternoon and tomorrow, and only the people that are in Brussels uh, are able to to uh, give their input into the debates. Um, it's not. A, possible to do that remotely and this is one of the things that is just very frustrating um, because you don't want uh, people to have to travel when and there's also some uh, citizens uh, and, and politicians that are not even allowed to travel yet because there's still a lockdown um, so it's creating also inequality amongst MEPs and that's something we shouldn't want. Well the Belgians are taking over the parliament. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and some Dutch uh, I saw already yeah. but um, yeah. Okay, thanks for this answer. I think it's indeed uh, very crucial to see that also data working not only has an effect on uh, everybody working from home, but also the institutions of our democracy, like the parliament. <clears throat> There's another question, which is more about the transition to a sustainable green employment. Uh, if, for instance, we are transitioning from building construction to improving the energy performance of existing buildings, uh, from airlines to railways, what does it mean for the labor markets? So, Kimo, yeah, yeah please go. Who's going, who's going first? Sorry. Please do, Irina. Okay. Uh, well, I. I think this is a this is a huge a huge question. So I don't know actually how to. Uh, give a simple uh, answer, uh, considering the, especially the fact that I'm working in the in the in the services uh, industry in this um, in, uh, in in that sense. So uh, I think that when we are talking about the the the, the green transition, uh, I think that uh, it needs to be followed with the, basically uh, with providing what it, what we are, what we call a, a just transition. So a, 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 trans, a tra, trans, transition that will not uh, actually uh, endanger workplaces, but allow workers to enter uh, uh, a new uh, uh, greener, uh, 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 greener jobs. I was talking uh, uh, as a care uh, care sector as one of the priorities that we should push, which I really think. But of course, there are different uh, um, uh, uh, different types of solution, and I think that it also needs to be. Uh, coupled with the uh, with the investment in the training and retraining and upskilling of of the workers so that they can uh, take up uh, uh, they, they can take up uh, this uh, uh, this job. Uh, so actually, the the question with the uh, with the going from um, uh, from from airports uh, to uh, to going to uh, the, the the railway system is that uh, is uh, I think that uh, uh, is actually. Uh, uh, probably uh, one of the one of the key points today. But what we need to also take into uh, consideration is, uh, for example, what does that mean for the for the security uh, of uh, for the security workers working in the in the the airport companies. So these are some of the questions that we need to uh, uh, to to answer to how to actually enter that uh, um, that, uh, that that type of transition. Thanks, uh, Kim. You want to add? If I may add to that, um, so I also think that you know, um, looking at the, the Green Deal and looking at the Just Transition Fund, for example, that there's a lot of opportunities. 
Um, one part of the Green Deal is the is the renovation wave. We need to renovate a lot of houses um, and, and, and buildings to make sure that um, uh, we get closer to a climate neutral Europe. Um, this is creating a huge opportunity for people to, to actually create jobs and, and, and foster the economy again. And I think we see this in a lot of sectors that if we really have this transformation, um, it is not only good for the, for the climate and the environment, but it's good for our economy and society as a whole. And I think that is um, perhaps easily forgotten because, of course, of the general framing that, you know, green stuff is expensive and, uh, and only good for the climate. And um, that is absolutely not the case. Okay. Hey, uh, another question for you, Kim, um, here. Elena mentioned, well, I mentioned actually uh, the, the word, I used the word, the bullshit jobs. And the question is, uh, how can we avoid this kind of jo jobs? Can the European and social committee be better involved? And also a question for Elena, what's the view of the trade unions on this? Um, that, um, you know, uh, for the more people that are in, involved to make sure that there's more pressure on the on the European Commission um, and specifically uh, uh, Mr. Schmidt to uh, to stop the existence of bullshit jobs um, is worthwhile. Um, we we really have to see if we can um, do several things on a European level. In my opinion, we should really have a look at um, whether it's possible to ban zero hour contracts, for example. Um, we really have to have a look um, uh, at the definition of a worker again. We lost that fight a few years ago, but um, we see that um, in California, they now have a definition for a worker. When are you a worker? When are you not? And if even in California, the place where, you know, the Ubers and the deliveries of our times are from, then I think um, uh, on a European level, we should also be able to do that. So I think if we if we make it just more clear what you know the the regulation should be what the rights are for the workers and also um to make it very clear that you know we're not listening to the you know interesting framing of for example an uber that they are you know such a futuristic model that they don't fit in our current uh, work system because uh, what they're actually doing is paying people per ride and uh, not giving them any benefits except for some sort of private system that they have uh, have uh, found it, um, which is basically going back a few hundred years in terms of labor rights. So maybe um, that is something that we have to point out more often. Okay, thanks. Um, Elena, the perspective I, of the trade yeah, unions on this? I, I cannot agree more with the with actually what, what Kim uh, now just said. So uh, we've seen that uh, the, the flexibilization of, of the of the labor market has actually um, is is actually resulting today in, uh, in an army of unprotected workers who have no access to to their right and uh, actually um, uh, who are who are completely uh, unprotected. So I think that the first we need to uh, to reverse this trend, as Kim said. So zero uh, zero hour. Uh, contracts uh, uh, should uh, should basically uh, be uh, banned. We have a, a, an army on informal workers. We have like platform workers who do not have the same rights as workers. So we have bogus employment. So these are all uh, some um, these are all uh, actually uh, uh, developments on the uh, on the on the labor markets, which which actually uh, brought this uh, crisis. Many of these workers. Uh, don't have actually the right of the, to, for example, to 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 have a uh, to have a, a, a sick leave. Uh, so imagine what 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 is that doing to them in this crisis? They have to choose between being uh, p uh, between being uh, between being paid or actually uh, uh, staying at, at, in, and securing their income or actually uh, staying at home. So I think that we need to move in 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 that direction to actually enforce. Uh, um, Higher regulation of the of the re labor market in in member states and and on the level of EU that needs to be I think one of the central uh, one of the central efforts uh, uh, today and we've also seen as I as I mentioned that uh, uh, informal workers and uh, uh, precarious workers are often non unionized workers uh, unions cannot often access these work uh, work uh, workplaces um, 
Uh, so, um, uh, and actually, uh, they are even uh, more unprotected. So that is why I was saying that uh, we actually need to uh, make sure that unions are are able to uh, to access the uh, workplaces, and that we are uh, uh, that we need to change the legislation as to recognize uh, the rights of that to value the same the rights of informal workers, the same as the rights of workers. Thanks for this answer. This uh, reflects what you already told before that actually this crisis, this crisis is a mirror of the society that was already there before Corona and now only the bad sides of this society are getting worse. We have an extra question for you, Yelena. It's regarding the improvement of collective bargaining. Can you say more about obstacles that unions currently face in accessing workplaces and what concrete steps should be done? Yeah. Well, uh, I think that uh, the, as I was saying, the whole co uh, collect collective bargaining uh, system is uh, uh, under a lot of pressure, and it's uh, actually the the number of uh, collective agreements uh, on the on the level of uh, company suspected sector is very much uh, uh, decreasing. What uh, this actually uh, uh, creates it, uh, is a specific problem uh, uh, at the workplace from, as we've seen this uh, crisis from the lack of personal protective equipment to securing better pay, to securing uh, uh, safe working conditions, to actually uh, negotiate uh, um, uh, paid sick leave, paid parental leave, negotiate benefits for workers to make our workplaces uh, better. So what the unions are, um, what unions are facing especially in informal and uh, precarious uh, emplo uh, employment than in the, in the in the gig economy is that uh, we've seen that the companies are uh, hostile to letting unions in as if unions actually are not a relevant agent of uh, of uh, improving uh, uh, the workplace and uh, that can actually work with with our governments and and with it, with employers i don't know if if we've seen the if you've seen the, the struggles with, for example, the Amazon uh, uh, workers, uh, uh, the Amazon workers today who do not have enough protective uh, equipment and are actually um, um, called to work uh, in the in the warehouses. So we had like a uh, like a huge uh, uh, trade union struggles on uh, on on that on that matter, and we had the situation in France when actually the workers and their unions uh, were able to win that the warehouses only work. Uh, uh, in distributing the essential products and not uh, and not uh, actually all the products. So th this is like quite a big struggle going on in there. So what the, uh, uh, what the uh, unions are facing actually is uh, hostility on the part of um, of uh, companies. And in, in the sense that we need to do uh, uh, to uh, to improve that, I think that we need to fix our national uh, national legislation in terms of our labor uh, in terms of our labor laws. And in terms of actually uh, uh, having better legislation on the uh, 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 on on these levels to actually uh, allow for trade unions to do their their jobs and actually try to make the legislation in such a way that we don't have like firing of trade union representatives uh, or as we have in some uh, in some uh, uh, who are doing their work as we have in some cases in the uh, in the in the, still in the EU um, uh, today. So to make legis legislation safer for uh, for trade union uh, uh, activities. Okay, thanks. Uh, Kim, there's another question on young people. And so somebody's writing, on the one hand, you could say if you put more emphasis on a digital society, this could be an advantage for young people. But on the other hand, uh, we have uh, poor people, also young poor people with little access to this type of technology, this type of knowledge. And so what should we do to make sure that there's not a kind of, that the digital divide doesn't get even bigger in this crisis? See also points that we really strongly addressed in the, in the recovery plan. Um, and that is that um, if we are now going to focus on European public investments to uh, boost the economy again, uh, closing the digital divide is one of the main issues. And that is both infrastructure, um, because there's still a lot of places where there is no uh, proper internet. Um, but it also means that there is more funding available in the end um, 
for schools and for for young people to um, to have uh, to have their own uh, technology technological uh, appliances. And um, I think um, if we really try to to make sure that um, you know everyone in Europe has access to internet, um, it can create a huge prosperity for everyone. And um, and it's something that we have to to strive for to to make sure that happens for everyone in a very short notice. Okay, thanks. Um, we're moving towards the end of this talk, and there's a last question here, which I can I really find marvelous for both of you. And so uh, the question is, as we have a representative from each sphere here political party and from a union how can green parties and trade unions cooperate and support each other even better in a post covid world who wants to go first <laughs> I, I will um yeah thank you thank you for for this question this is actually uh i really like the opportunity um that i got to actually be here with the uh, with you today so I really appreciate it, and I hope that uh, we will have more of this. That that uh, that first of all, um, I would uh, what I would actually uh, like is to uh, uh, because uh, in our trade union we are uh, continuously uh, developing policies, um, uh, including um, the, uh, the the green policies, which are which are very also crucial for our union. So uh, we would definitely like to collaborate more uh, to more on, on, the, on, on the matter to collect both your experience and uh, and uh, your policy. That would be actually very very meaningful uh, to us. So um, and at the same time, uh, the the only thing we can do is actually offer our expertise and offer our uh, policy insight on trade union and and labor matters. So I hope we will uh, definitely. Um, collaborate uh, on, on these issues. Okay, Kim. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think uh, it's very nice to have this discussion today. And I also think that um, too often we perhaps only speak um, uh, together um, when, when we're really talking about policy matters. But to create a vision for what the future of work should look like, what the future of labor rights should look like, is something that we maybe not always take the time for because there's not that much time in the end in a day or in a week um so i think uh, these kind of discussions are really beneficial for that and i'm looking forward to have many more ex especially because it's so necessary right now okay thank you both for this uh, very uh, interesting and inspiring talk uh, for the people listening if you appreciated this talk and you want to support us support the Green European Foundation so we can organize more of these green post-corona talks, please uh, consider giving a donation. Uh, there will be information now put in the chat. And to finish, I really want to draw your attention to our next green post-corona talk, which is next week on Tuesday at six o'clock on the future of mobility, which again, an excellent panel. We have Leonor Gewessler, the Austrian minister for for climate action, environment, energy, mobility. We have William Dodds, executive director of the NGO Transport and Environment. And we have Elke van den Brandt. She is Brussels minister responsible for mobility, public works, works and road safety. So this will be again, a very uh, timely and exciting talk. Many thanks for watching to us and hope to see you next week again. Okay, we are offline. Many thanks. I think it went well. <laughs> <laughs>